So if you're a professional painter or a professional wallpaper installer, I have a suggestion for you. Sometimes you have to show your customers the alternative to your services. Let's go in a bathroom that I contracted to paint. Okay. Okay, now take a look at this. Take a look at that. That's what was left by the previous painter. That's how he left his customer. Okay. Look at that. I kid you not, folks. This is what's this is what's being offered in the construction trade today by so-called professionals, okay? Are you seeing what I'm seeing here? You see this? No. Okay. And that's how they they seal up the joints. So you want to fill in your nail holes to your trim before you paint. I have a video on dyeing the the uh, the white material before I put it into the hole so that I can see it when it's dry. All right, this is another way to do it. Now, I get this question a lot when I'm painting trim. I'll first say, I did not install this trim. So you want to fill in your nail holes on your trim, your wainscoting, your crown molding. There are a few ways to do it. I have a video that shows you to just put a little color into it so that you can see it when it dries. Well, here's another product I use as well, okay? And there are several on the market just like it, but it's excellent. And you can stain this stuff. Plastic wood, okay? Dry decks. It's got a, what's called a dry time indicator. But here's the main thing. Get this stuff in your hand, okay? And just let's bring them into these nail holes. You see that? That's it. Show you. If you go like this, look. And just zoom in on that, just show them. That's gonna be your worst nightmare, okay? You simply want to put it on with one finger and knock it off with the other. So anyway, I'm going to go around and do this. This birch, we're going to sand this if we have not already, because we want to make it fine and smooth before we paint it. By the way, if you're doing wainscoting and you're painting this, this is in a bathroom. This is not going to get knocked and, and, and scratched. You could use sheetrock for a lot less money instead of having birch plywood for your wings coating. Just an idea for you. After masking everything off in the bathroom, getting ready to spray, I want to let you know that I went to my go-to product for the raw birch. So that was our raw plywood. We sanded it down first with a sanding sponge, about 120 grit, and then we went to a 220 just to fine it off and get it nice and super smooth. So the next step was to seal the wood. It says primer on here, but you're also going to see that it seals knots. You see there? on the label, seals knots. Spend the extra money, use bin. Okay, so now we had a caulk where the birch meets the wainscoting, the vertical pieces here, and so also the horizontal under here, etc. So now I'm gonna go to the staircase and we're gonna be spraying the staircase, which I have masked off. Let me show you what we've done. Just to give you an idea of the magnitude of preparation that's involved with spraying a uh, spindles. So just for these alone, which is uh, at the entrance of the home, 
just for these alone. Look at all the masking. But it's worth it. We covered 12 feet over, all the way over on the adjacent wall of our painter's plastic. Taped it up there because there's silica dust. As soon as the spray comes out of the tip, you have paint that's coming and you also have paint that's drying as it's coming toward the surface. That never makes it onto the surface, but makes it onto your adjoining surfaces. So you want to protect your surfaces from silica dust. And that is the white powder that you see all around after you spray a job. You say, what is this? Well, it's the finest particles of paint that dried before they landed on the surface you were, you were painting, okay? And uh, it's actually dry paint. But if your floors have humidity on them, guess what? That dry paint becomes activated and becomes sticky and will stick to surfaces. So avoid the problem, spend the time, and mask. That plastic you see there is going to cover this wall because I don't want any dust on this wall. So we're using the Titan Cap Spray 115 for this task. And what I'm using is one of, truly, one of the finer products on the market for white, glossy finish. And you can see it's a semi-gloss, right? And so this is the emerald urethane trim enamel. Okay, it's pricey, but you know what? It's worth it, in my opinion. Use the better products on your tasks and just charge more money. Just go with the best stuff. Proven best stuff, not things that claim to be the best, but actually proven. Now, as you can see, this is a full can, but I'm stirring at the bottom. I'm kicking up the bottom. And so for those of you who paint, you know, this is a little boring, but I have a lot of do-it-yourselfers who watch my channel, who, without exaggeration, open a can of paint, forget to get paddles at the store, give a little shake in their hands, and then they're done with it. But little did I know, paint generally sits on shelves for about 90 days. And after 60 days, you have about an inch of thick, coagulated paint on the bottom. And so this is how I stir my paint. I kick up the bottom and I bring it to the top, go back down. And I do that for over a minute, one to three minutes, depending on whether or not I feel thickness at the bottom. Then I suggest that you do it too. Once you start drawing from this can, you, uh, if you didn't stir it properly, you will uh, alter the, pr the proportions of paint and all of the other ingredients that go into it. So you wanna make sure that it's homogeneous before you start drawing from the can with either a brush, a roller, or your sprayer. Okay, quick note on our sprayer. This is our spray canister. The hose will attach here. Now, when you're spraying material like this, just take note that on the back of your spray can, there's directions on spraying, brush, tells you, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but it tells you what brush to use, okay? And now look, it even tells you what roller to use. And also, look at this, spray, airless pressure, look at that, 2,000 PSI. And look, they even tell you the tip, okay? Now, I, suggest that anybody who uses a sprayer and is new at it, that you simply call the technical people at either Titan or Graco or whatever the company is from which you purchase your sprayer. They have technical people who will help you determine what's best for your sprayer. Now this happens to have a needle in it. Okay, if you look here, you see this needle, this brass piece here. 
Well, that has a certain diameter thickness. And that thickness affects how much paint comes out of this tip. You see it right in the center? <clears throat> if you're using a thick paint from emerald, such as urethane, well, if you use the wrong needle on your Titan sprayer, you will have a very problematic spray pattern. And so these Titans generally come with needles that are numbered one through five. And just remember, if you ever buy one of these things, that the higher numbers are for the thicker materials. So for this, you would want to use a number four or five. Okay, and for your thinner paints or paints that you thin down, you could go with a three or possibly even a two. But something like stain, if you were staining or you were clear coating something with a, a clear coat, those generally are thinner products and you would want to use the lower number one or two. That's generally the information that you need for the Titan cap spray. I featured this in at least one video before. And today we're going to be spraying the spindles. Now, why would I be using an HVLP sprayer for spindles? Well, if you go back and look at my last video on how to spray a glass-like finish with an airless sprayer, this is what you're going to see, even though I use the fine finish tip. You're going to see a fan of spray come out this thick. Could you imagine how much paint you would be going through by using the wrong sprayer? This is a more controlled release as compared to the Graco Airless Sprayer starting at 395, for example. This is going to give you a lot less waste when you're painting fences or you're painting spindles in a house, okay? So there's a major difference. And so, of course, this is what I'm going to, to paint these surfaces. Now, I wouldn't take this sprayer and paint this wall with it. Theoretically, you could. You wouldn't do that either, hopefully. And so, that would be the wrong application. All right, so we're setting up the sprayer. The sprayer comes with a long hose. The only side that can connect here goes right to here. The air comes out, brings it to that end, which is where you put your paint cup and your spray gun attachment. Now, if you were on the job and you needed uh, to, you didn't have a compressor around and you needed to blow off dust that you created from sanding, as a last resort, you could actually use your sprayer. Check this out. We have a switch down here for high, low. Put it on high. On the other end of our hose is the connection to the spray gun. Right in the middle of your screen is a quick connect. It threads onto the hose below. Quick connects onto the tip of the spray gun. Very good technology. Um, very fine piece of equipment. You can, you can get them at Sherwin-Williams. I paid about $1,200 for mine. Protect me from the spray dust. I'll be using a 3M 6001 protective mask. And so we're finalizing the encapsulation of the work area by creating a curtain. We, we want to prevent any silica dust from entering into the lower part of the home. And so rather than cover everything, just build a curtain where the, the uh, dust will get trapped and you'll see it at the end of the job, all attached to the plastic and you'll be happy that you did the curtain rather than have it all on the shelving and all over the place. That's very unprofessional too. Spend the time 
and make it right. If you do choose to tape to the ceiling, just be aware that the tape sometimes leaves a tacky residue on your ceiling. So if it's a flat painted ceiling, I wouldn't attach it directly to the ceiling. I would attach it only to light fixtures, etc. Now we're going to start spraying. If I put the direction of the spray with my pointer vertically positioned up and down, I'm going to get a wide horizontal fan. If I turn it this way, I'm going to get this. Let's just show them the difference in pattern. With the Titan, you see how that just spit? What you do is you depress the trigger first, you let the air come out, and ideally you want to start on an area where you're not painting. So you want to start on the floor. You want to start on an area that's masked off. So you don't do that onto your painted surface. But this is practice. Let me show you. So you can see the spray pattern. Look at the concentrated area of that paint. It's awesome. And that's why you're using the HVLP. That's the reason. Now, if you used an airless sprayer like the Graco 395 or higher, you would get a fan of at least four inches if you're using a 200 plus tip. So, and it wouldn't give you this controlled pattern. Let's switch it because I'm going to opt for a wider fan. Again, we depress it, letting the air come out first. And look at that, there's no running, no dripping. I should tell you that I'm operating the, the machine downstairs on low. So you know there are two switches, high and low, I have it on low.
So, what did we just do? We did this side and this side. But now we have to get this side. We have to get these parts in here. And that's why you want to use the HPLP. Okay. It throws just enough paint where it's not dripping all over the place, where you got to keep coming back and perhaps hit the same area a third or a fourth time. Okay? If you don't have a need to buy one, try to rent one. Okay, can you show them enough flow? Can you show them enough close? Oh, sure. Nice and slow. Up and down, please. If you notice how I'm moving the sprayer, my sprayer is moving with the frame of my body. Let me show you what I'm not doing. Here's why. You've gone through car washes before, right? And you go in there and this arm comes out with all these jets and it, it goes over your car like this. 
right? There's none of this twisting of the jets. Why not? Because the jets would not allow the water to come out with the same pressure if it changed the distance from which the water flowed from the jets. It would be at a greater distance and therefore clean less. As soon as I change the angle, I change the distance, I change the distance between the paint coming out and the distance of the target. And so, to keep it universally shiny, without flashing, without lap marks, and without spray marks, we apply the paint at the same pressure, at the same distance, and at the same angle, so everything looks the same. If I were to do this, I'm 13 inches from the railing right here. Watch this. I'm 16 inches from the railing here. That'll be a difference in appearance. Okay, very good. Would you please show them up close? You could drop the hook.
Yeah, you can show them, show them the whole thing. So coming out of the staircase, at the very bottom of the staircase, this is the curtain with which I have surrounded all of the air. Now, as I told you before I started, see the dust on there? Imagine having to clean all of that off of your shelving, your fridge, everything. Why not just trap it here? You see those white? It's almost like snow, right? So that's how you want to do it. Encapsulate yourself and the job with plastic. Now with, with any sprayer, what happens is the air comes out, it's a machine, it gets hot. So you see where it gunks up right at the center? You wanna have a little brush to get that paint out because it'll interfere obviously with your, your spray pattern. A simple toothbrush will do, or some hot water right through the sprayer hole.
Sarumakko Vedanasya. So now we're just going to give the spray area about 10 minutes, maybe a little less, to let the snow fall and attach itself to all of the masking and then we'll just pull it off because we don't want any bridging on the masking and the painted surface, which means that it would form a seal. But there's so much humidity in there, it's not going to form a seal. But if you leave it too long, it will, and then you're tearing the paint. And then you actually have a repair to make. So you don't want to leave the masking on long at all. I'll give you a general rule. I'd say 15 minutes, 20 minutes tops. Pull off your masking where the surface that you didn't paint meets the surface that you did, where you have that paint line. Now what we'll do is, you see, we, we blew it off from top to bottom, right? It's a great tool. You just detach your canister, go in there and get the dust off. We know those of us who use these sprayers, we're doing doors and everything else. Isn't it a great idea that you don't have to go out and get your compressor to blow dust off of something that you're going to be painting? Now, of course, we're gonna go around with the vacuum and get up any of that residual debris, which didn't come out from our powerful air hose. Okay.
Okay, so with the curtain blocking any debris that might come out, we're going to go now spray the wings cool. Just to give you an idea how little material may be coming out of your sprayer, let me show you. And the reason, this is the reason why you don't move fast with this sprayer. This is a very controlled application. Check it out. So if I, do you see the difference in colors here? It's thick here. This, this all has to do with how fast you're moving. So, and this is also the reason you wouldn't be painting a wall with this thing. Can you imagine how long it would take if you had a spray with this? This is for finer stuff. You want to paint a very flawless coat. It's going to take a while but it's for fine things like picket fences, multi-surface objects like this, the top, the side, this. And why is that? It's putting very little paint on you. So you can hit this three times, it's not gonna drip on you. And there you have it. That's why we use HVLP sprayers. Okay, let's do it.
mostrar. Thank you.